Welcome to the Battle Ready Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Erwin Raphael McManus. It's good to see you today. It is good to see you. You've been a little bit under the weather? I have been. I kind of have this sinus thing going on, but thank God it's not COVID. So we had to do a disclaimer. You do not have COVID. I had to take that pregnancy test thing at home where you like <laughs> swab your own nose and you like wait for the line to turn pink or blue and you're confused like what's pink, what's blue, am I having a girl or a boy? But and you came I'm out negative. negative. Yes. All right. And so. In a year and a half, you um, haven't, haven't gone sick once. Haven't gotten COVID the whole time? No. Fauci's plan was working. <laughs> no, it's not. But I mean, we were bound to get sick at some point, right? Yeah, I think a lot of people are getting sick once they've come back out. Hear, you can hear my voice. Yeah. Because we haven't been around a lot of germs for a year and a half. I don't even, I guess so. We haven't really been around a lot of people. Like, right, we, right. Like on so, every that's week, what, that's multiple what times people, a week. I call them germs. You, you call them germs. <laughs> we would be around thousands of people every Sunday, right? right. So it, it is a completely different, I guess, rhythm of life. Though I do feel really good. I do feel good. It just just my face. It's my face is, <laughs> so my sinuses are, are a thing. But that's, I mean, I always get allergies and sinus infections and that's a normal thing. So we are here, we're doing this. So if, you, if you're wondering why I sound different, I am good. I am healthy. I'm well. I wouldn't be here in the studio if I was sick, sick, or even close to being positive. Not true. Not true. That is true. <laughs> I care about all of our teams. We get we let them get tested whenever they want. Um, we are actually on in a different location. If you're watching this, we're we're mm -hmm. on the stage in Hollywood at Mosaic. At Mosaic, the gallery has taken over the battle ready room. So our clothing stuff is everywhere. We have racks of clothing. We have people running around. Uh, that tiny little like 300 by 300. Well, speaking of that, don't we have a drop coming out? What? Um, we do, but all of our models are sick this week. So <laughs> we, I couldn't shoot it on anyone. So it'll have to be next week. We do have a, a drop coming. Very excited. We have some shirts, some pants. We have some button ups. We have some like really sick pants. We have a couple other things that I'm excited about. So if you're listening and you like really great summer clothes, check out McManus Gallery next week. Next week, and the summer's not over. No, no, it's going to stay hot through September and October. It's so crazy that if it, everyone talks about um, global warming, so you have to you have to dress for climate change. And, and I don't, you got to dress for climate change. <laughs> I don't know about global warming, but the globe is warm. <laughs> so I'm not trying to be a pretend environmentalist. I do care about the environment. I don't know enough about it. But today we really wanted to get into this kind of this this topic of education. Yeah, maybe coming at it from two different directions. Okay, set well, us up for it. Well, one is we got a great question from Brooke about how do you move out of thin thinking, which is a, a phrase I use and actually we both use oftentimes about, about um, being trapped in thin thinking and not really thinking deeply or... Um, allowing the complexity of an issue to be factored in. And so, you know, how to, how to move out of superficial thinking. Okay. But also, what, uh, you know, what's the role of education in this new world? You, you know, is um, our kids, our future generations, are they being set up for success going to school in a, um, in a system that really was designed for a very different world? And it's, I think it's an important conversation because right now schools have been closed for a year and a half. Teachers really, most of them that I know of, do not want to come back. Uh, certainly the teachers union are incredibly hesitant about bringing teachers back into the classroom. Thank you so much, Kevin. And Kevin keeping us alive with these T's. And you can see Kevin is limping, but no time off. No time Our off. team is getting <laughs> rocked this month. It's been a really hard month. I think we've about 22 of my friends have had COVID or have fallen down hills <laughs> like Kevin <laughs> and almost died from st staph infection and sepsis and, and, uh, and then sinus infections and other kinds of things. So it's been a, a crazy month. It's bound to happen. Okay. So here's the thing. So but, we want to talk yeah, about education. Yeah. Be yeah. Because even as, as classes are, are not opening and schools are not opening and kids have been are coming. schools not opening? I, I think they're, they're sort opening of, up this They're fall. reopening, right? Yeah. On-campus attendance is, is happening. So they're, they're, they're actually going to get to be in class now. In class, yeah. Elementary school, high school. That's exciting. And, College, yeah. And I know it's been a challenge, right, for, yeah. for students and teachers. And, and, you know, some of the transitional stuff I saw was come back one hour a day, which doesn't make sense for parents who work 
how do you take your kid to school for one hour and wait for them and come yeah. back? And, and then others have been online learning and then others, they go to school, but to teach, but they're actually learning online in class while the teacher is doing something else. And it, I think it's a really important time to revisit education. What is it? What, what kind of education is needed for the challenges of the new world? Okay, so I am a little bit of my story. One, I come from two very overeducated parents. Growing up in a family where both you and mom had graduate degrees um, in theology, and you uh, went on to kind of earn an honorary doctorate, which was pretty incredible being mm -hmm. at that ceremony with you. Uh, uh, education was really important in our household. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys, you and mom were very, very intentional on us making sure that uh, making sure that we knew that we had to break the the generational mold of people not being educated in our family. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uneducated. I, I hate saying uneducated because, uh, you know, I, I think our family, are they're great people, but you guys were the first people to accomplish college and then to go into a graduate degree in your families, right? Well, not, not, not your, my side of family. Not your side, but mom's. But, but, mom's but your mom's, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I mean, your grandfather was a professor. Yeah, my, my grandfather's a professor. And your mom knew like I seven four languages. cousins were medical doctors. My, yeah, my did uncle you, was a lawyer. Did your mom really know that many languages? Yes, my mom, I don't know, spoke four or five, six languages. But she had you really young. Yeah, like but she 16, was really 17, good right? at languages even when she was young. That's incredible. She married my dad because he was teaching Lincoln. Latin and Russian in school. Fascinating. And so she she was his student while he was teaching languages. Yeah. So I remember, okay, so growing up, I did really, really bad in school. I was really a poor student. And I wasn't for the lack of trying, but I think also being your son and being mom's son, it is almost the worst thing in the world. If it's not hard enough to be a pastor's kid, it's mm -hmm. it's even worse to be like a teacher's son or a teacher's mm -hmm. kid because you have high expectations on both your educational prowess and your spiritual um, growth. And so, going to a Christian school when I was when I was little, mom was teaching there. I was mm -hmm. going there. I was really not fitting in, and I think it was really hard for my mom because mm -hmm. I think she wanted to just see me excel on the educational side. All right. So she pulled me out of school. You pulled me out of school one year. Yeah. And you were like, you're coming to my office every day. I'm going to homeschool you-ish thing. Travel school. Travel school. Yeah. That's what he called it. And so, you know, mom was terrified that I was going to mm -hmm. be this inept, incapable human being that that couldn't read and couldn't write. And, and I, my writing, handwriting was terrible. Um, and I would be like, look at dad's. He can't handwrite either. Like, <laughs> it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. um, but you really kind of created a, um, a really like... You kind of created a tailor-made kind of system for me. But there was one year where mom homeschooled me, and that was the year of Armageddon. The year <laughs> didn't go well. If, if God could have returned, if the revelation could have happened, it should have been that year. <laughs> it did not go well. That was your apocalyptic year. <laughs> that was my apocalyptic year. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I was a bad student. She was a bad um, um, – she, she was very impatient with me. And it's not her fault. It's my fault. But I think a huge part, one thing that she like, just n nailed into me, just beat into me, was that I needed to love reading. Mm -hmm. I needed to love reading. So when, you know, you go, to, you go to like high school and they give you a textbook and you maybe get like three-fourths of the way through and you kind of skim chapters of chapters and the teacher will kind of fill things in. Yep. No, no, my mom would make me sit there and read every page of every history and English book that there, there ever was. And she'd say, when you're done with that, you go to the next one. You're done with that, you go to the next one. So I think I, by the end of my eighth grade year, I was like somewhere middle or the way through like my junior year of high school in like my history reading. And she's like, she just didn't know what to do with me. I think reading was the only thing that would get me to shut up and not be so anxious. So she would just always have me read. And so now looking well, at she it, wanted you to know everything, you know, whether it was she really did. geometry, geology, geography, and that was just the G's. Just the and, G's. You know, she, whatever subject was, she wanted you to excel in it. And you guys were like yeah. incredible, right? Because you didn't have much money. Um, you guys were figuring things out. You would you would pull in people that you knew from like the church. You know, you know this. You knew this like math engineer who was working at JPL, and he would come in and teach me math mm -hmm. once or twice a week. And I figured out that if I could just get him talking long enough, the hour of math would be over, and he would have <laughs> taught me like almost nothing. So I would just, I learned how to like work him and work mm -hmm. the, what a sweet man. Do you remember his name? I cannot remember his name for the life. We're not going to shout him out here. Okay. <laughs> but but he, we ended up becoming really great friends. I didn't learn much of math, but all that to say that when I, by the time I made it to university, I got into Pepperdine. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things where I was so much more prepared, I think, for college than a lot of my friends because I had had this kind of, um, you know, mix and matched 
piece together education that was both on my own homeschooled, but also together with other people. And I think a lot of people go in from this like public school system or private school system or preparatory system, and they go into college being very, very anxious, very nervous, where I was like, I know I can manage my time to some degree, X, Y, Z. But it seems like now, even more than ever, well, I ended up dropping out of college mm -hmm. <laughs> twice. And it, but it, it seems like now more than ever, there's this pressure to, you're not even going to high school anymore. You're going to a, a prep academy like a college preparatory academy mm -hmm. to get yourself, to get you into college. Like these kids have pressure in preschool, in kindergarten to like test at these aptitude tests to get them into these like high end, like private school systems in these major cities to then get them to an Ivy League. How, and then, and then you're just talking about kids who have the privilege. You're not talking about kids in that, it, the, you know, the, the rest of the rest of the, the young population who cannot get into private schools, who have no option, but to go to whatever school their parents mm -hmm. are close to. And so, the education is important to us. You're an educator. Absolutely. Mom's an educator. Where do you want to go about starting this conversation? After well, I think uh, your mom my having a, a teaching degree, K through yes. ninth grade, and being a really an excellent teacher. I mean, her classrooms were always the uh, the highlight of whatever school she was in. But we had a very different philosophy toward education. Kim had the more classic philosophy of education where you should be good at everything and you should get A's at everything. And really that's it. That's the measure of your child's competency. And I had a basic view. I felt like you need to do, you need to be able to do basic math so that you can run a company. And so if you can't do basic math, then you won't know if your employees are stealing from you or if your company is going to go broke or whether you're making a profit. And so I, I wanted you to be able to do basic economics. And then I wanted you to read and write. If you can read anything, whether it's War and Peace or The Odyssey or, or Dune, and uh, then your, your imagination has no limit. And, and you'll begin to absorb philosophical thinking. You'll begin to um, deal with complex issues about what it means to be human. You'll, um, you'll be able to begin to have ideas that have not yet been translated into something real in the world. And so reading is so incredible. And the other one's writing. I felt like you, you needed to learn how to write. And, and even though you have not yet released your writings to the world, you're a really, really good writer. And writing is really important. So that kind of drove Kim crazy. I didn't, I didn't care about you being well-rounded. I wanted you to be skewed. I wanted to find out what you loved, what you were particularly good at, what you had a unique talent for, and then just let you kind of burrow there and just keep working there. Now, if we had found out when you were, you know, six, seven years old that you just had this natural affinity for physics or whatever it may be, or, or the violin, what, you know, I didn't, no, and, yeah. and yeah. then we would have like gone in that direction. But I do think what's interesting is that um, when I took you out of school and you traveled the world with me, so by uh, by the time you're 18, you've probably already been to over 30 countries around the world. And people who travel, by the way, are um, far more complex in their thinking. People who travel tend to be happier. People who travel tend to um, be the opposite of racist. They tend to be more inclusive. They tend to be um, more organic in their thinking. Travel really does change you. I consider travel a, uh, a luxurious um, approach toward education. I don't mean luxurious in terms of people having a lot of money. I mean, not everyone gets the privilege of getting to travel a lot. And, um, but it's one of the best ways to learn. And I know this because coming from El Salvador, going back and forth between El Salvador and the United States, it was an education that wasn't factored in and it de definitely shaped me. It made me who I am. And, but when I brought you back in sixth grade to a little private school that um, we were able to get you in for a few months. They tested you. You had not been in school that entire year. And you came out with a college level vocabulary. Your reading and comprehension and vocabulary were at a college level. And what happened? And they came to me and asked me, how in the world did you get your son to test out this level? Now, everything else, you were, you're, you're, you were just a sixth grader, <laughs> you know? But, uh, but in those things, you were at a university level. And I said, the key was they took you out of school. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I educated you myself. And she said, uh, please don't tell the other parents that. 
<laughs> and I think part of the problem is that uh, education is so standardized, it assumes everyone is the same. It also assumes everyone learns the same. It also assumes everyone has the same learning capacity and, and the same learning style. And it just isn't true. And so I, I've felt for decades that education needs to be radically uh, revisited and that um, the way you educate girls is, is different than the way you educate boys. And, and I know we live in a time oh, right geez, now. Oh, geez, that's a big statement. It is a big statement. Doug, I know. Please explain why. This is a time where you're not supposed to state any differences between male and female, men and women, boys and girls. But the truth is that girls simply develop faster than boys. Girls have uh, faster emotional development, faster intellectual development, faster relational development. And, you know, so it's like girls become, you know, here you are in second grade and, and a girl is, is already a fully developed human being and a boy is still, you know, coming out of the stone age. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and then you want that boy to sit in that chair all day when one of the things that he has is a disproportionate, disproportionate amount of energy and testosterone developing over time and, and, and just more hyperactivity. And I actually think one of the reasons so many boys are medicated in our society is that we, uh, we, we think that a, um, a well-behaved boy is a medicated or docile um, or passive child. And, and I kind of think boys are supposed to um, run and go wild and get out that energy. And, uh, you know, even if you just look at from an evolutionary perspective, you know, you're designed for the hunt, you know, and now they're telling you to sit in the cave all day and learn there. And so I do think there's like different dynamics. And I know this is a generalization. And, and of course, the problem with a generalization is that there are always exceptions. But, but the power of a generalization is that they're generally true. And, and so I know there are exceptions, but the rule shouldn't be ignored. And I just think the learning models are wrong. I think forcing children to sit in a classroom all day in a chair is the least productive way of learning. I also think that we may be teaching children things that will not help them have better careers. And so you end up with $100,000 of debt when you go to a four-year college. I mean, if that's public. Yeah, that's, that's a public school. Yeah, that, and private school might be three, three or $400,000. And you have a degree in general studies or you have a degree in psychology or you have a degree in, in you know, um, or, or marketing, yeah. And you, you end up doing nothing with your life that's related to that degree. And I actually think that we live in a time now where, I mean, the people who are shaping the world are dropping out of Harvard. <laughs> you know, they're not, you know, I mean, I, I think that from Elon Musk to um, Bill Gates, you have, um, I don't even know I, if Steve Jobs finished college or not. I don't, I don't think he, and, I think he went straight from high school. But you have, um, and, and I, I know so many people who are massively successful um, not only six figures or seven figures, but um, their, their, their wealth is in the hundreds of billions or even the billions, and they barely finished high school. And one of the phrases that has really struck me is, um, I didn't fail school, school failed me. And I, I think it's a really important question to ask right now, since we're fighting about going back to school, what what do our children actually need to be educated in? At which level, right? Because, you know, one thing I realized coming out of university, I went in to go, I wanted to study film and I didn't quite know how to get myself into film. I grew up in mm -hmm. LA and was around a lot of it, but it wasn't necessarily like integrated in it. You were in the, you were doing mostly church work at the time, mm -hmm. but you were loosely connected to filmmakers and writers mm -hmm. and people who were starting off their journey and their career. And so I wanted to go and learn how to write film and to be in production and get kind of my feet wet in the beginning of it. Um, and at the same time, when I, when I, when I, when I left, I realized like, I learned most of what I needed to learn in this like summer course that I did at USC, like 19 going to 20 or 18 going to 19. And it was like three months of, you know, writing, directing, cinematography. And beyond that, everything else was general studies and mm -hmm. kind of more focused production classes, which was great. But I, the three months were worth probably more than the, the, the next three years. And when I left, I told you, you know, I'm looking back at it and I'm like, I don't really know if I needed it. I don't, you know, it's, it's great to take 
the general studies. It's great to, 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 to educate yourself and to continue learning. But I, I didn't know, I left college not knowing how to cook or doing my taxes. Mm -hmm. And those are two things I would have loved to have learned. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I learn how to cook? How do I learn <laughs> how to do my taxes? And do you think that the educational, I guess, structure system in America teaches kids, whether at any level, but maybe let's go at the collegiate level, how to actually be a full functioning adult? Well, I, I definitely think that um, there, there are at least two sides to this. One, schools cannot parent children if they're not being parented at home. And so a lot of people blame teachers because they're having to work with kids that are out of control or um, don't know how to function inside of an organized system. And people are expecting teachers to fill the gap of families or parents. And I think that's a burden that teachers really can't bear. There's just no way a teacher can fill the gap of what isn't happening with a dad or a mom at night and on the weekends. And, and so let me just, you know, give a shout out to educators who are having to tr try to help kids who are really being neglected and not being And you're raised. saying more at home, right? Yeah. What age group are we talking about? You're talking about kids, children, or we're talking about like, I was talking about the university system. So what, what age, what, can we be more specific? I, I, I am going all the way um, from elementary school to high school to college. Okay. You know, uh, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to college to actually prepare for their career. I, I'm going to guess it's going to be like 10% or something like unless that. Unless you're a lawyer, doctor, Yeah, accountant. unless you're specializing, you, you know, and, and that's what you have to go to law school. You have to go to medical school. You have to go, you know, to postgraduate school. And, and so those people obviously are preparing for the careers. But I think the majority of college students or university students who are getting a general studies, that, those four years, other than giving them four years to grow up and maybe mature, has no bearing on their success in the workplace no bearing on their career. And I actually think that that should be revisited. Why, why are universities charging so much money for degrees that do not guarantee jobs? I mean, if you paid someone $100,000 or $200,000 to invest in you for four years, there should be a job guarantee at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And yet colleges are not responsible for their product. Interesting. And, uh, and, and so there is no accountability for colleges and universities. To, when you ask the question, if I go through this program, will I come out of the other end ready to work, ready for this career, ready to succeed? And I think those questions should be revisited. I also think high school needs to be revisited. And when, when you look at high school students, and, and I, I mean, when I was in high school, I did terribly in high school. And, and my question is, like, why isn't high school more focused on asking the question, you know, what, what skills and talents and competencies um, do these students have where we can prepare them for the next stage in life? And so a lot of it feels to me almost as if you're going to school just to avoid real life because it doesn't prepare you for work. It doesn't prepare you for your career. And uh, nothing I learned in high school uh, I mean, that may be too extreme. So I'll say it's extreme. Nothing I learned in high school actually made me functionally prepared to do what I do. And, and so ironically, most of the things I learned were outside of school. I, um, I learned the joy of reading outside of school. And uh, I, I learned the, the, the power of writing outside of school. And, and so I'm really grateful that in school I learned how to read and write. I'm grateful that in school I learned math. But I, I can tell you that 80% of the time I spent in school probably didn't prepare me for the world I was going to face. I, I think we should do more classes on technology, more classes on uh, how to develop computer expertise. I mean, we, really, schools should look at where careers are and then begin to prepare people to be qualified for those careers. At least that those are my thoughts. Yeah, it was, it's interesting, right? Like I ended up doing a little bit of, I don't know if it, I don't know if you consider it consulting, but I sat down at the high school, like I, I went, one year I went to a private school in mm -hmm. high school and it was the, the school that was in our neighborhood and a lot of my friends were going there and they like wanted me to go play sports with them when I was not very athletic, but two, I don't really think I made much sense for that school. And, and I sat down with the, I guess the Dean um, of admissions a couple of months ago and some of their team and, and it was really interesting because now they're having this conversation of like, how do we innovate and get to a place where we really can create something unique? And 
I hope they don't mind me saying this. I'm obviously going to keep them nameless, but but they were really like um, leaned in. And I sat down with them and just asked them, what do you think makes yourself, what, what makes your school different than any of the other schools in the area? And he's like, your relationship with God that you have at this school. And I was like, to be really honest, like when I went to the school, it was my junior year of, of high school, I was 17 years old. And my relationship with God was not determined by the school that I went to. If anything, it was kind of maybe hurt by the school that I went to, not mm-hmm. by that school, but just sure. by the kind of um, forced upon thing of, or or structural rigidity of, you know, you, you, you have to pray in your homeroom class and you have to go to this chapel and you have to listen to this person speak and you have to, versus like this, this kind of, I guess, an approach that created more intimacy and connectedness mm-hmm. of like, how do you actually build relationships with other people? And so I, 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 I talked to them and said, I was like, look, a 14 year old isn't really focused on the relationship with God. Not that they shouldn't be, they should be, that you should create an environment where they can have a faith journey. But I was like, but you, the first thing you should stop doing is making most of your students lie to you before they even show up on your campus. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you make pe- kids, these kids sign this paper that says, I believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, yeah, we do. Like that, to go to a Christian school, you, you got to sign that. And I'm like, but most of your kids are probably 50, 50. Let's go 50, 50. They're lying to you. And they started laughing. They're like, we know it's a thing that they, we force on kids and then it's not healthy. And I'm like, so why is the first thing you do? You've started four years off of a lie. So you're teaching them hypocrisy. <laughs> well, you're teaching them, you're teaching them that <laughs> if I tell you what you want to hear, I'll get what I need. And for me, that feels a lot, that is a lot of the educational system, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of me telling you what you need to hear, how about you help me understand how to process this information, how to build a relationship, how to, who, whether it's a spiritual life or maybe it was like even in film, my, my favorite class in college was this guy named Tom Shadiak who had written the, the, was it Ace Ventura, he, the mask. The mask. Patch uh, Adams. Patch Adams. He had done, what was the really cheesy one where Jim Carrey was God? Bruce Almighty. Yeah. So he, you know, I think he had like grossed like over a billion and a half mm. in his movie career. He's a director, writer, and he has an incredible story. And I remember the day I went into Pepperdine, I was sitting with my like, I guess my like film production what are they called when you have like a guidance counselor? They have like they give you, they assign you like some kind of person who's like a dean over your major. And so I was having a meeting with her. Your advisor. Advisor. Yeah. And someone called her and said, Is there any availability for this class? And I happened to be in the room. And I said, What is that class? And she's like, first years aren't allowed in it. And I'm like, Well, technically I transferred in, so I'm not a first year. And she's like, That's a great note. I'll put you on the class. It's Tuesdays, it's Thursdays for four hours, once a week. He brings coffee. He brought a coffee truck. He brought a pizza truck. And he gifted every single kid in the classroom bicycles. And he's and amazing. He's amazing. And not only did he do that, he would bring in, he brought in Jonah Nolan, Christopher Nolan's brother, to to talk to us about um, Batman Begins and his relationship with Heath Ledger. And, or I guess it was the Dark Knight, right? The Dark Knight mm-hmm. and his he, relationship with Heath Ledger because Heath had just passed away the, the semester before. He brought in his agent from CAA and the guy called out and said, if you can get Tom Shadiak to make another movie, I will give you a job as my assistant. Because mm. Tom was had given away, he like moved into a little <laughs> trailer or something. He had sold all of his, you know, house and like gotten rid of a lot of his money and was donating a lot of it and building a lot of these other things. And I remember he would bring in the most fascinating actors and actresses, people in the real world. And he kind of curated this thing. He's like, look, you're, this is a pass. This is going to be a pass or fail class where I ask you at the end, if you decided if you passed or failed, depending on how much you put into this mm. class. And so it was one of those things where there was so much, um, it was so organic, so open. And it forced me to lean in because no one was making me. I had to choose if I was going to be engaged in this class. I did not miss a single one of his classes because mm-hmm. it was so important to me, not mm-hmm. because of the free stuff, but genuinely I felt, I felt like I was stealing the entire time. And like, I didn't understand that there's people in this world that were that generous and that open and just genuinely wanted to give everything away that they had, mm-hmm. whether it was education, whether it was, and I think, I think if the educational system was given more of that ability to be free, I think there would be a higher percentage of leaning in and actually extracting the things that kids need to learn to be the most successful in the world. 
um, I ended up leaving this that's the school like not, not like I think a, a year later when I wasn't doing the I was doing incredible in my art classes and then awful in my general studies classes but also I was just so uninspired and I do fear that whether you're growing up in a major city or in a suburb or if you're you know whether it's a high educational system or maybe you go to a really bad school um I do think that there we lack this engagement with young people mm-hmm in this like yearning to learn because if learning either is not cool or 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 the basis the construct in which you're learning the environment which you're learning is so hostile and does not cater to anyone's creativity like how do we actually build a bridge between you know how do you one how do you get the best how do you have every kid in america have the best teachers in the world is that even possible that's a great great question well one i think you have to pay teachers more or do you just hire the best 50 teachers in the world and you video class every single one of them? And so every kid in the world is actually getting to access the best person in their field. I mean, I think that's a great idea. I do. Yeah. I, the one thing that would be missing is the interaction between students unless they could put those students into a classroom together. Do they need to be in a classroom now? You know, Or do they need to be like in an online No, I, I think children need to be in a classroom because the human interaction is as important as the subject matter. And and deeper learning happens, I think, in when there's when there's dynamic interaction between between people, okay. or even when they're children. Yeah. But I think one, I, I think that kind of master class idea of having the best teachers in the world to be available to any student anywhere in the world could revolutionize um, and flat and flatline education to where the poorest child in the world could access the same quality of education as the richest family in the world like i understand that like everything in the u.s and everything in the world to some degree is uh an achievement Mm -hmm. of elitism Mm -hmm. right like you 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 live we live very privileged lives in the u.s and then to say that to say that um i go to an ivy league or that you know i went to a four-year university is Mm -hmm. a big thing and then to say i went to an ivy league is a big thing to say i went to a certain i'm alumni of a certain university is a big thing but doesn't it feel like an archaic ideal that that there's like you know 10 or 11 schools and Ivy Leagues that are are the most elite and that if you don't get into them you'll have no you won't have the same access to information as you will the other people like there's a thing called Google now that exists that we have we all have the same access to the same books to the same understanding to the same outcomes but we're learning it through a different mechanism or vessel one has you know a crimson red on it and the other one has like a baby blue and the other one has you know an, mine was an orange and baby blue we had the worst mascot of all time at pepperdine the wave <laughs> um but it feels like an archaic idea that a kid in you know in inglewood or a kid in hollywood doesn't get the same education as you would in like you know a calabasas or in a malibu um, and, and it's true it's true you, well you don't yeah but no, it feels archaic yeah i mean it's not incidental that what 20 20 percent of our presidents have all graduated from Harvard or Yale, you know, yeah. they're basically two schools control um, who ends up leading our, our nation. And when I worked for 10 years in a deeply impoverished area, I realized that the grocery store in the area that was poor, the, the, the groceries cost more money and they were lower quality. Right. The meat cost more money and it was the meat that had expired from other grocery stores. And then I went to the more affluent neighborhoods and food costs less and it was higher quality and i couldn't understand how it was possible that in impoverished areas things could cost more and be lower quality and in the rich areas things could cost less and you have higher quality but this is a part of the inequity that we live with and i think it's true in education that uh you know even for myself when i spent 10 years working among the urban poor a part of like my ambition was i wanted to be a great communicator because i wanted these people um that i was serving to have the highest quality learning possible and and i felt like a part of my contribution was to be the best in the world that i could be to bring that in an environment where they're they were not used to the best in the world so how do you bring the best of the world to the to the most underprivileged Uh, well i think your idea of finding a way to uh democratize the best education by maybe there should be like this um this school that hires the best teachers from first to 12th grade in the world and and um, access makes them accessible to students all over the world and, and pays them to teach 
and uh, and you can get it in in you can get it in Beverly Hills, you can get it in Inglewood, you can get it in South LA, you can get it in Pasadena, and you could, you could get it in Mumbai, you could get it in, know, in right? Cairo, and, uh, and you get it in Ethiopia, and all of a sudden education at the highest levels being provided for kids, and because one of the things that you know in the formula of education, especially when there's children, is that creating a desire to learn is as important as the material that you're trying to teach them. And if you teach in a, in a manner that diminishes the desire to learn, you're actually hurting the long-term good of that student. And I mean, yeah. one of the things that your mom did is her classroom created a desire to learn. And I told her years ago, she should make a career of teaching teachers how to create learning environments that are compelling. And I feel bad for and, teachers because I, I, I know one, I terrorized a few of them. <laughs> but two, you're one of, you know, yeah. depending on where you live, you're one of 20 or you're one of 50 right. in a classroom. And, and one person cannot manage 50 monsters. Like it is just, it, it is not, it's not possible. And then to expect all 50 of these kids or 30 to 50 um, to, to, to learn the exact same way, the exact same um, process and then to achieve the exact same thing is is unreasonable. Mm -hmm. So, how, but and then how do you create something that's tailored to each child, while still bringing them together, while still learning at a high level? Because I'm going, for me, it makes it simple. Like the moment the internet exists, the world became an open source. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that we monopolize at higher education to a certain point. And now I'm talking like a socialist. That <laughs> not that so not that education should be free, but I do think that the best education should be open source. And that if we would solve so many of the world's problems, if the most underprivileged had access to understanding the, some of the greatest information in the world, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I know for a fact, I probably wasn't going to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> there was just no way I was going to know it all. But I, but you know, had I like learned early on, mm -hmm. maybe different aspects. If Chef's Table had existed when I was in high school, I would, there would be no, without a doubt, I would have gone to a trade school and gone to chefing school. Yeah, There's no question. Yeah, the culinary arts would have been your- It would have been exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. The, the lifestyle, the, 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 the creativity, but all, with the structure and the process, it is something now that is so attractive, but that, the, you know, I was so oblivious to, to what that was. Mm -hmm. You know, we grew up, I, you raised me in a great life, but the first 10 years of it was pretty hood. <laughs> McDonald's was a treat. Sizzler was like the bet was like eating at the Ritz Carlton. Yep. You know, the fine dining wasn't something that I had ever even heard of. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know existed. Well, <laughs> I didn't know what Michelin stars were. So to be exposed to so much at such a different age now, especially with the internet, how is it that we can guide young people and bridge the gap between young people and the master educators of our like generation? I, I think that. One of the maybe part of the challenge is that the only solution that people are giving is the government needs to take control of education. And I've just never seen historically that when the government takes control of something, that something gets better. It tends to standardize at the lowest level rather than elevating at the highest level. And and I and I do think one of the challenges is when you have labor unions and um, that protect everyone who's a teacher you really eliminate the positive aspect of competition where you're, um, you're rewarding those who are exceptional in their field. And uh, because you're otherwise, you're, you're actually treating people the same. And, and you know, and so I, I look back and, I, and you know, I never knew about private schools or anything. I, mean, I went to a public school all my life, right, you know? And fortunately, I had a teacher here and a teacher there that was amazing. But I would say it was it was the exception, not the rule. And 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 then when I went to you know college, I went to Elon University, I went to uh, Chapel Hill University, North Carolina. Um, I had more exceptional teachers, more exceptional professors. Like it became more of a rule than an exception. And getting to be in those rooms with people who actually sparked my imagination, they made me hungry for learning. They there was a connection between what I was learning and who I was becoming as a human being. It was it was an incredible gift, and and so I don't know what the solution is. Um, I I would tend to be a person who, I do like the idea of charter schools. Yeah, I do like the idea of um, I do like the voucher system for the. I, I actually think that 
What's the voucher system? Yeah, we're we're um, we're all paying taxes for public schools. Yeah. And you can, and if you did a voucher system, you could put your kid into a private school or a charter school, and that would, and those taxes would pay for that school. And I actually, but I think that that voucher system should be targeted in underserved, underprivileged, and low economic areas to give kids who do not have the advantage um, of of being born into a family with with resources. Well, Salvador, that, that child could be put into a really good school. El Salvador did something. The president of El Salvador. Yeah. What, how do you say his name? I. Uh, Nayib Bukele. Bukele, Bukele yeah. yeah. So he I, bought, I, we already talked about this, but he bought iPads and tablets for every young person. I think in the whole country. Immediately he did it for all high schoolers. Yeah. And then he was like working his way down from, I guess, seniors yeah. so to like every, kindergarten. Every student in the entire nation could have a laptop. Could have a laptop or a tablet, yeah. depending on what age. It was cool yeah. too, because I read the breakdown and mm -hmm. he, he based it off of their age group. So I think he said something like five to 12 year olds would rather have a tablet than a laptop, but yeah. then like high schoolers need a laptop and university students need a laptop. Mm -hmm. So you kind of talked about like how each one was different and what they needed is how they would have, they would grow into a different like tablet or yeah. a different laptop over the age. And I thought that was such an interesting thing, right? It's like, mm -hmm. can, I'm not a big believer that the government gets everything right. And you put it in the hands of the government that it will get better. I do think though that there needs to be some kind of like, whether it's, there needs to be some kind of activism from the government. Like, can Google, Google has the, probably the most information, Google and AWS, Amazon, has the most information sitting on servers. Can they create a system in which we are learning at the highest level and able to gift learning to children at a subscription-based level? Like, you know, I, I think we're more willing to feed people than we are to educate people. Mm. And, and I... And everyone needs to eat. Like the idea of even people going hungry now feels like um, medieval. And 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 yeah. like if we have this ability to stop hunger, which I understand is much bigger in and of itself, why we know we can do education. We know we can achieve something. And I think maybe the reason why I'm so passionate about it is when you were more educated, you were far less likely to end up, one, in prison, to end up um, it, repeating the cycle of, of um of 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 get, joining a gang to uh, re re repeating the cycle of you know selling drugs or getting to a place where you're a destructive um, part of society mm -hmm. and not to say that the suburbs are perfect but that's a huge thing is like people move people to bubbles so then protect them from all the outside world and like can we create something where people are so highly educated it creates this sense of understanding and knowledge so that they go I would never want to make choices that would limit my future. Mm -hmm. Something that you've told me in the past is that, you know, freedom is a choice. Mm -hmm. you, you you make a series of choices that either limits your freedom or expands your freedom. Mm -hmm. And so education is one of those things that I truly believe if given to someone at the right time, at the right moment, early on in their life, if they have access to it. They will have this understanding and reality that they can be free someday. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's on us. I don't know. It's, it's for me... Even leaving university, I went to my mentors and was like, do I leave? Do I stay? What do I do? And he was like, you are not meant for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's getting his PhD at, at I don't even know, somewhere in, in Tennessee. And he was emailing me and he's like, you know, you know, we're talking about like, I went to him and was like, do I go and do this venture with you? Do, do I go and take an internship? Like, what do I do with my life? And he was like, you, you really need to figure out your unique path. And university is so unique and such a special privilege, but it isn't the same for every single person. So how do we, I think what we've created is this like cookie cutter system of education and we go, here it is. And if you fit into this, you will succeed. And if you don't, you're going to kind of get pushed along the side mm -hmm. and we'll figure out what to do with you later. Mm -hmm. So how do we create a system that instead of doing that, instead of creating this kind of cookie cutter um, block system actually creates a more tailor made educational path for these young kids all over the world? I mean, it's a big, big question. And maybe that's, maybe this is the, the episode we ask the questions and we come back later with some bigger, better maybe, answers. Yeah. Um, because I think what you're asking is so important. And what, what comes to my mind is the reason your mom and I had such a focus on education is because education is one of the things that can break you out of the cycle of poverty. A lot of times once you're educated, if your parents are educated, Education doesn't break you out of the cycle of poverty because you're already out of the cycle of poverty. Right, right. So now education may not actually lead you to the opportunities you have right. uh, that you want. And because education, when you're poor, 
can actually open up a world of opportunities that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Right. And so I kind of look and go, okay, the, here's a, three things that made a difference for me. One was education, but it wasn't just education. It was social networks. I, th I think that there's not enough of an emphasis on the social networks in, yeah, in, see, in higher education. So if you go to school at USC, you get to meet people at USC, and those people become not only your lifelong friends, but business associates or your investors, potential your business, business partners. partners. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and w when you lack the social networks, you, you lack the dynamics of the opportunities to help people succeed. And which leads me to the third thing. It's one's education. The second one's social networks. The third one is access to money. Where when you're rich, you can borrow money for nothing. But when you're not rich, you can't borrow money with everything you have. Right. And, and so I know in El Salvador, I mean, a huge part of the problem is that the poor don't have access to banking. And so when they do get a loan, it's an 80% interest rate. Right. And which is insane, right? And no, no person with, with wealth would ever pay 80%. But, uh, but how do you make sense of a world where a poor person has to pay a higher interest rate than a rich person? Right. And, and so I think that a part of what needs to happen is that our educational system needs to realize the goal of education is to give per, a person the tools they need to create the best life for themselves possible. And it isn't to pay for the education. And I think this is part of the problem. We have a system where we're, we're, it's more leaning toward we have to pay for the structure of the public schools. Uh, we have to pay for the universities. You know, when the, our government starts saying we want to forgive everybody's college loans. Yeah. I mean, no one forgave mine. I paid all mine back. Yeah. And, um, but here's my question. Well, instead of forgiving college loans, why don't you begin a process to make sure colleges aren't overcharging? Because they have million and billion dollar endowments. And so you're, instead of dealing it from the institutional end and saying these institutions are charging way too much money and uh why would you say no we're going to raise people's taxes to, to pay this absorbent tuition i feel like that the battle the problems keep getting solved in the wrong direction and and so i i think the reason i want us to have this conversation is um i think we need the best minds in the world solving the problem of how to help uh, the underserved, underprivileged, those who are trapped in economic poverty, get the best education possible. I think your idea of finding a way to uh, bring the best teachers in the world online to make them available to everyone uh, wherever they are at is a, I think, is a brilliant idea. And I think somebody should go, I'm going to find the 100 best teachers and pay them a million dollars a piece. And, uh, and I'm going to create this endowment. Uh, for these hundred teachers, you know, the best math teachers, whatever it be, you know, English teachers, literature, and uh, they're going to get paid, you know, seven figures, and we're going to get their teaching to any student in the world that wants it. And that, for me, would be a huge step forward. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of great ideas out there, but maybe we should all be thinking about how to create the new educational system so that we can actually educate the future. So I have another question. I think that's incredible. I think, um, so I have a question and maybe not want to go here, but I've had, mm -hmm. I've had two different conversations about this, right? Mm -hmm. I have, um, conservative friends who have kids who are now in the Pacific Northwest who are having to figure out if they want to put their kids through sex education at, mm -hmm. you know, I guess it would be eight years old. Yeah. And, so having this conversation with, with two different dads, right? Mm -hmm. um, dad in Pacific Northwest whose kids are, you know, I think eight and 12. And mm -hmm. they're having this conversation of like, they're talking about, you know, trans, bisexual, LGBTQ plus, but really more along the lines of like, you can choose your identity, your sexual identity at a really young age. And then have, we had another conversation, me and you with, with another dad who's in California and in Calabasas and talking about how, his son is, he's, he's a follower of Jesus, like the dad is, and his son's really little. And he's like, my son's best friend is, you know, a, a transgender. transgender, and he's like eight years old. So I don't know how that happens. But they're, they're best friends, and they're the eight-year-old boy is a Christian, the other boy is transgender. Transgender. They're best friends. But he said that 150 families left the school when they found out this kid was transgender, and the school wasn't going to essentially kick him out. And he was like, there's no way. Like, I'm called by Jesus to love everyone. And so I'm going to, of course, I'm going to call my son to love this kid no matter what. And mm -hmm. I'm not even telling, you know, he's, we're having conversations about mm -hmm. it. And he goes, maybe a little earlier than I would have liked. Um, but then. What Another family in Beverly Hills, same thing. They found that the school was teaching their kids 
uh, not sex ed, but actually um, gender ed, like general. Yeah, help you know, walking him through of you know, even though you are a male biologically, you may not be a male. You you know, you may you know, you may be uh, something also something different. And right. parents didn't even know this was being taught here in LA in public school at such a young age. So for me, like, you know, I guess there's two questions and maybe we don't want to talk about this. We're not mm -hmm. expert on this, mm -hmm. experts on this, and we're not coming from a mosaic platform to talk about this. Yeah. But like, I was really young and I think my first sex ed class was sixth grade and it was mostly just like organ identification, like what your organs do. It wasn't <laughs> on the sexual side. It was just like, you know, for boys, you got this and girls, you got this. Biology. Biology. Yeah. And it was very basic. And then again, it happened, you know, my freshman year in homeroom and in public high school. And that was like the most awkward class in the whole world of like, <laughs> you know, watching a childbirth on, on, we were literally on video. Like we didn't even have DVDs then. Like we were still VHS. This so much of all this change. When I was in high school, yeah, we had a class in half the semester, it's driver's ed, and the other half the sex semester ed. sex ed. That's in high school. <laughs> like, like by that time, it was a little too late <laughs> to be having that conversation. We both knew how to drive. Let's teach them how to drive and then teach them how to, yeah. So, but my question is this, is that like, you know, the, the story from, from, our, from our friends was that like, you know, they had a teacher in the school who was transitioning and while they're, they're on paid leave while they're transitioning. And, and when, I think when they came back, um, the kids were like really confused going like, okay, why is she, like he now a woman? And so one of the substitute teachers brought in a children's book that said explaining gender identity mm -hmm. and how you can choose when you're a little kid. And it was a kid's book. And so like, you know, my, my thing is this is like one, I, you know, you want your kids to understand what's going on in the world and all the things that are happening, but what age is the appropriate age to kind of let your children into this conversation, you know, because I'm like, Eight seems too young. Yeah, you see, and I actually think the. Do question, you want to talk about this? Or you yeah, no, I think this is important. Hey, and I, I feel like this is as as gracious and open a, a conversation as you can have. Right. And um, I think the, the 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 maybe the more important question is not at what age, but in what context is this really what public schools are supposed to be doing, or is this what parents are supposed to be doing? But it was interesting because in the public school system with the substitute teacher who brought in the book, mm -hmm. parents were going, hey, look, we're we're liberal, but like, we're not trying to teach our eight-year-old to choose between being a boy and a girl. They don't even, they don't know, they have no sexual function yet, right? They don't have a sexual identity. They have a, they're just a gender identity. And even then they're still figuring everything out, just how to understand all the things that are happening to their body. Do, are we in an era that seems to, sexualize children at an earlier and earlier age? There's no question about that. There, there, there's not only not a question about the fact that our, our, our culture is over-sexualized. Right. Everything we talk about, it seems like as a culture, is right. about um, our relationship to our sexuality. Okay. And, um, but at the same time, it's, the, the, the question is, if we're going to, to, create the best educational system in the world, shouldn't our classes be focused on things like learning English and writing and, and uh, you know, literature and, um, and math? But biology and would be one of those things. Biology would be one of those. And, and I think that that's where education should never be a pure representation of the state. Okay. Education should be a representation of the parents. And I so. see, I, I'm, I, I, let me, in This is some, a hard conversation. This is have. a hard conversation, but in like in socialism, like in Russia, children are actually seen as belonging to the state. Yeah. Not to the families. And in our nation, our history is that children belong to the parents, not to the state. Right. Well, it's changing more and more. Yeah, and, and so I think there's a more fundamental question here. You know, um, are our children supposed to reflect the the thinking of the state or the thinking of the parents? Yes. And 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 if the state reflects you, then you might say, "Oh, well, the state." But but right. okay, if you're let's say if you're a liberal, and all of a sudden the state becomes conservative, do you really want a conservative state? teaching your children conservative values when you actually want them to learn liberal values. 
And right. if you're a conservative, do you really want a liberal government teaching your kids liberal values when you want to teach them conservative values? And see, Absolutely I, not. See, I think the educational system should have respect for both um, for for the both. liberal and conservative right. mindset. Right. For, bo yeah. for both mindsets. I, yeah. I completely agree. So, like, then, then how does, you know, I guess. You can't teach mutual respect. You can't teach mutual respect. And that's really important. To have mutual respect, um, each child would need to have somewhat of an understanding of the situation at hand, right? So when it comes to gender identity and choosing your gender, um, or even if that's, even if to some people that's not a thing, how do you teach that in a way that doesn't lead a child to, I guess, confusion? There used to be a critical understanding of a premature exposure that you do not expose children to adult narratives, themes, frameworks, concepts before they're psychologically ready to handle to them. understand it, right? Um, it seems that we have lost that sense that there is any appropriate uh, premature exposure. And, and I think that's a part of the challenge right now um, in our educational system is that people are fighting over that when Really, we need to be talking about, hey, how do we provide the best education for our kids? Right. And, and so I, I don't, man, I wish I knew what the right answers were. I don't. And I wish I knew what the solution was. I don't. And, um, um, but I think what's going to happen more and more are that parents are going to take their kids out of the public school system. And, and when it doesn't reflect their concerns and and um, and it's not even again like the situation in Seattle. It was actually all the liberal families that were upset that the school was exposing their kids to uh, conversations without even talking to the parents. Yeah, and a lot of it was 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 completely leaving them out. Yeah, out so it. it wasn't a conservative liberal conversation. It was really a who's raising my kids, me or you? Yes, conversation. And that, and I think that's a huge that's a huge yeah. issue, right? Because I think. More than anything, I mean, definitely that school and most of the parents would be highly liberal. Yeah. They're going, look, we're really liberal school and really liberal families, but like we also have like a conservative perspective on when we let our kids know. Mm -hmm. Like we want to talk to them about these things. We yeah. want to have these conversations. Yeah. And not every child has that, I guess, that privilege. And I think maybe that's where the school system kind of get, can get lost. But I do really think that 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 what we teach is important and how we teach is, is even more important. I think being a young person, I don't think I was aware of any of these things that young. So I can't imagine what children are going through now, having to like process so much information, so much understanding of their bodies, their minds, their, their, and how they interact with everybody. And then to know that it's like something that's highly political and highly like, um, and very much at, at the mercy of what is happening in humanity mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. And then sometimes the question or the response becomes, well, that teacher has rights. And, but in my mind, the teacher is not the customer. The, the, the student is the customer. That child is the principal concern. And you should never put the teacher and their concerns over the students. Right. And, and I feel like those are, those are some of the things that have to be, I think, factored in. I mean, this conversation went somewhere we didn't really expect it to go. Yeah, and and, I, and I, I, I think it's... Uh, an important conversation because it's real it's happening all around us and we've been getting that question from so many people and and what what i think is interesting when i when i see something in culture it's not when someone on the left is upset about something on the left or someone on the right is upset about something on the right it's when someone on the left is upset about something that you think oh they wouldn't normally be upset about or someone on the right being upset about something they wouldn't normally be upset about yeah well, I, I thought the response from our new friend He's also like a, a young dad talking about how he's like, no, he's like, if I really believe in Jesus and really believe in all this stuff, mm -hmm. why am I going to be worried? Yeah. Like, my kid's going to be fine. Like, he has good parents. I'm a decent enough parent. Then he's going to love this kid. And that kid's going to love him. And they're going to be good friends. And he's like, I want to show them that like, that show them meaning I want to show my children that you can love anyone and love everybody and be a part of a process to help people find Jesus. Mm -hmm. Given it's a really unique standpoint because a lot of people have a lot of, have a very hard time with, this um, gray middle of going like you can actually act in a certain way versus, um, um, sorry, hold on, let me start that over. I think we have a hard time in, especially in the faith world, um, 
having an understanding for the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, you posted a message last week. You did a message last mm -hmm. week um, from Mosaic talking about how, you know, we we're supposed to do a worship night on the July 18th and doing, you were going to speak a message. We we're doing live recording of worship for the first time in our main building in a year and a half, over 18 months. And we had to cancel it because the government at midnight decided to, midnight Saturday night decided to close down all large gatherings. Um, you had to wear a mask. Yeah, so mask, mask mandate. Mask yeah. mandate. And so we've always said, like, we we want singing. We don't want this mask thing. And not that we don't believe in it, but that we want people to feel free to be able to do what they want. Then the sheriff came out the next day and said, um, the local government isn't actually following the CDC or, our, or like, our state government, so we're not going to enforce the mask thing. But your response was really important. I feel like your response was, we are, well, maybe you can talk a bit about more about that, your response to the whole situation. Well, you know, my, I mean, my response was pretty straightforward in that um, if it was just personal, I would open up and I would meet and we would not have masks and we would sing and, and, and enjoy life together. Yeah. Um, but I've always taken the posture of being super respectful and being um, really aware of the health concerns. And also our city is incredibly sensitive to the concerns around COVID and masks and, and I mean, it's Hollywood. So this yeah, is probably one of the most liberal, you know, areas in the United States. And so for us to open up and to um, not have masks would have actually, for me, created an obstacle between people and Jesus. It would not have made it easier for people to believe in Jesus and trust him. It would have made it harder for people to believe and trust him. And so we make our decision based on the good of others and, and how um, our, witness of who Jesus is affects them. So it was interesting to see kind of the blowback. And I don't know about you, but like for me, I, I didn't, you know, I really don't like it when people talk about us and people talk about us negatively. It really mm -hmm. bothers me. I don't know if I turned a corner or this stuff just meant so little to me. It didn't matter what they said, but I never seemed to be upset when conservatives dislike us. Well, I had so many conservatives coming at me going, you need to grow a backbone. You're a coward. You're, you have no spine. Yeah, you're, you're a hypocrite. You're a hip you, yep. Yeah, you, you know, you don't, you're you know. a false prophet. I'm, yeah, I mean, I mean, I was just getting railed left and right, you know, why don't you grow some? I mean, you had, you had, you had <laughs> politicians trying to like yeah. ladder climb off of your Instagram. And it was, it was really interesting to see going like, we didn't do this out of fear. We didn't make a decision no. out of fear. You almost never make decisions out of fear. You always make decisions you know, thinking about both sides, but always thinking mm -hmm. about people who are furthest from um, yeah. the, the, the furthest from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, it always blows my mind because I would look at the, up these people who they were, <laughs> who was commenting, who were commenting and it was like, they're from Dallas or, and we love Dallas. I'm not saying Dallas is bad. Like they're, they're from, they're from Kentucky. They're from, you know, Tallahassee. They're from places that have never really went closed during COVID. Or Florida. Yeah. Or Florida, right? I think that's where Tallahassee, right? Is Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so for me, it was, it was really interesting to see, I'm going, okay, if, if you don't understand the context of your environment mm -hmm. or the environment that we're in, it really is hard to understand what we are going through week to week. Yeah. If you've never been closed down mm -hmm. due to COVID, <laughs> it's really hard to understand that like there were months of our lives where we weren't allowed to go outside. Yeah. But also if your church is filled with, um, anti-vaxxers, no mask or conservative Christians, Opening up isn't an act of courage. <laughs> no, it's not an act of courage. It's just, just being normal. Yeah, it's being normal. And I'm like, and you know, this is where it's a little, it was a little challenging for me because, you know, I, I do have, uh, you know, an ego. And, uh, well, you really like when people like you. Yeah. I mean, having so many people call me a coward and tell me that you're a backbone. And, and there's a part of me that, you know, um, I, I just keep thinking to myself, I don't think you'd be that that bold if we were face to face. Oh my gosh! I was this that one kid. Who was that kid? I got. Oh my goodness! I was so irate. He put. What did he post? But then he I was. That's something. not what Jesus would do. No, no, this is for all you thirsty drama cats out there that just that want to, that want to know. This is what this kid said to me. He said to you, and yeah. I just I commented and was like, ah, oh, what did he say? Here, hold on, I'm pulling it up right now. This guy. He said, while you play the safe road, people are without a church. The book of John says a true shepherd doesn't abandon his sheep, but a hired hand does. You've proven to be a hired hand, a smooth talking salesman, not a man of God. Hope your congregation has found a church that is open to call home. And my response was, 
at Matt Brown Sounds, pull up 7107 Hollywood Boulevard. Let's see if you talk this big and biblical in person. <laughs> then I got nervous and was like, maybe he's this like super conservative right winger with a bunch of guns hitting in his basement. So I deleted my comment <laughs> afterwards. But here's my thing with that is that I I always wonder if these people would talk as big in person. I just don't think they would. I think I think this is kind of the beauty of of the reality is that people get Twitter fingers and Instagram bravery and they go off. And then when they're in person, they like to run and hide and get a signature on their book. And yet I'm going to dig deep and say to every conservative who's called me a coward, who tells me I have no guts that I'm, um, you know, um, man, uh, just going to love you <laughs> and uh, just going to dig deep and uh, you not let you be my enemy. And just like, you know, I mean, I, I, I started reading those going, wow. I got everybody mad at me, left and right. I can't, you know, I, <laughs> I have no place to call home. <laughs> we have no place to call home. And there's, yeah, there's no libertarian home in this world. But I, one last thing, I, can we bring up something that's just kind of funny? Okay. I did get a suggest, <laughs> a topic, a topic suggestion. And because like, I, I always want to make sure that we're not TMZ, <laughs> that we're not another <laughs> version of some gossip talk show, especially in the faith world. But someone hit me up and was like, Hey, you guys seem to have a very different perspective of Joel Osteen than others. Can you guys talk about your perspective on the podcast? And and I said, you should hit Joel up and ask him if we could do a podcast on him, and even if he doesn't want to do it. He's such a private it. guy. I don't such know a private person. Yeah. But, I, but I guess there was like, was there some drama about him in some car or something? Him driving like a, he was a Ferrari in, around Houston. Who knows if that was even his, but probably he could afford a Ferrari, I imagine. Do you want to talk about that at all or no? Well, so you're already talking about it. <laughs> so, I just thought it was kind of a, how long, how long have we been right. going? Oh, we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. All right, we'll just throw this in here real quick. Well, first, first of all, my thought was, dang, I hope it's a nice Ferrari. <laughs> it looked nice. It did look nice. Well, and, you, you know, I've had the opportunity. Yeah. I don't know how I'm transparent I should be, but I, okay, I'm just going to be super transparent. Yeah. And um, I wasn't a fan. Of who? Joel Osteen. No, we it, thought that guy was so cheesy. Because only because I'm, you know, it's just not my cup of tea. He's right? always he, smiling. Who can be that happy? He just seems so happy and so positive. No and, one wants to like the guy who's so happy. And he holds up the Bible, and they all say the same thing about the Bible. And so, so he's also so good looking, and that's frustrating. And uh, and so, I, but but I never like never thought anything negative about him. And, and then my sister uh, in Florida, she would listen to Joel Osteen all the time. And I'd never really heard him. And she said, you know, Joel Osteen is my happy pill. So she told me, she goes, I listen to him because like I, when I need to be happy, he helps me be happy. And then, and that's I go into meetings in the movie industry and with all these Jewish people and all these atheists. And they would also, they would always ask me because I'm a pastor. <laughs> they would say, Hey, do, do, do you uh, know T.D. Jakes? And do you know uh, Joe Olstein? And and I thought, oh no, here comes the bomb. And they always loved them both. Always loved them. And so I realized everyone who doesn't believe in Jesus loves these guys. Loves TD and loves. <laughs> they, they go loves with Joel. TD Jakes. And they go, how does he do that, man? It's like I know he just like he's just amazing. He's so talented. So and it's because they're looking at it from a talent filter, right? And then and then with Joe Olstein, they always just say. Man, I would just feel so encouraged, or, or, or it just makes me so hopeful. And I, and I began realizing that one, Christians, we, we just tend to just shoot our own. You yeah, know? we're the we're the most cannibalistic culture, I yeah, think, on yeah. this earth, and, other than sneaker culture. And so it's just because someone doesn't, you know, teach the Bible or talk about Jesus the same way that same way we would, yeah. we think, oh, it's terrible, right? Well, no, they don't. We don't just say it's terrible. If we just said it was terrible, that would be fine. We say it's heretical, a heresy, that, it, that he's, like, he's a false prophet, that yeah. he's a thief, that he's all of these things. Right. And then when I had cancer and I came here to Mosaic and announced it on Sunday morning and no one knew except you guys, yeah. my family. Yeah. And I told them, hey, this Tuesday I'm going for surgery because I waited to the last minute to let everybody know I had cancer. I walk off the platform and I have a text from someone I did not know, had never talked to and didn't even know he had my number. And it was Joel Osteen. And he didn't have your number. He had to go out of his way to get your number. That's right. Like, so it was more intentional than he Evidently, had. his wife, Victoria, who had been here, I think, at some point. Yeah. You were gone. Listens to the podcast. 
and told Joel, hey, he, Earl McManus has cancer. Yeah. And this man who I was a stranger to reached out and said, is there anything we can do? We're praying for you. First person, first person in the world. It's insane. To reach out to me. So, um, and and then eventually met him in Victoria. And played then basketball got, with him. Then we, we got to, yeah, went out to his place. And, um, and I can tell you, kindest, most sincere, um, thoughtful, intelligent, happy, happy. Yeah. yeah he, he is, is just, he is who he is. You know, so if you don't like the guy, you don't like him because he's just happier than the rest of us. I know. Okay. So <laughs> I want to, I want to talk, I want to talk. And he is kinder than the rest of us. I want to talk about my three situations, right? <laughs> so I get this guy, this guy sends me a DM and says, can we have a podcast centered on thoughts about Joel Osteen, please? My response was this, this was last night. It would be really short, I think. We both really love him as a person. He's one of the most kind and authentic people we've ever met. The criticism he gets is odd considering how insanely nice and normal he is as a person. I don't think anyone who's that nice is that normal. But yeah. <laughs> but I have two other friends. You know, I had another buddy hit me up. And, he has uh, great kids. What? He has great kids. He has, he has great kids. Where'd you find that thing that you just texted me, Brooke? So it says that he hasn't taken a salary from Lakewood Church since 2005. Because he yeah. doesn't need to, because he sells millions of books. Like, but the, here's what people. No, wait, hold on. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. So then, I've had two other, two other conversations in the last couple of years about Joel Osteen since your when you got cancer. So I guess yeah. it would have been since 2016. I had one friend hit me up and say, um, "He, what do you think of Joel Osteen?" I said, "I actually really like him. Um, he doesn't preach on hell enough." And I said, "Well, why does he need to preach on hell?" he's that's not his message his message is hope his message is, is jesus and it's and it's joy and he's like well he's not a true like like speaker like a pastor a man of god if he doesn't preach on hell i said that's ironic because you live with your girlfriend who doesn't believe in jesus and you're engaged <laughs> to her and so like you know so I was like i was like we're, if we're setting up double standards let's let's be real about our double standards yeah. the second one was my other friend responds and goes sends me the article about the ferrari and goes, dude, that makes me so happy for this guy. Like, like I want him to go get his. I want him to go and get <laughs> his car. He goes, pastors should be able to like be so successful that they can also be pastors and live a really fun life. And and I was like, it really does. I think oftentimes our perspective and our outlook on certain situations or people often reflect our inner world. Yeah. What we project on others is a reflection of what's going on inside of us. Yeah. So if we want someone to preach about all of our sin because we're not dealing with our sin and our guilt and our mm -hmm. all these things, I guarantee you we're projecting a lens of going, you don't you don't do that. And it's you're not doing what I need you to do because someone needs to change the thing inside of me when really it's just my problem and I need to adjust some things. But I also do really think that like the different versions of how you see people who really need to not judge. That's my first and foremost thing. Like, why are we judging someone who most people don't know? We have the privilege of knowing him. And I think it's part of our role in, in this whole thing is we've had the privilege of getting to know people who most people only get to talk about. And it's really funny when people talk negatively because I'm like, oh, that's why I was put in that room because you've never met them and I have and he's actually awesome. Yeah, I just think that we would love for people that we don't like to be unsuccessful. I know. <laughs> What is with that? So, uh, first of all, um, whoever took a picture of Joel Wright driving his, his you know, Ferrari. Ferrari, wow, you, you just need something better to do with your life. I know. <laughs> because, I know. Um, you know, let the guy live. It must be so hard to be Joel Osteen to go, I can't go outside. I know, right? <laughs> you know, because the moment I go outside, someone's going to find something or do something or, you know, and... Um, Some of the sweetest human beings, though, and his his son Jonathan is so incredibly kind, and and his his wife Victoria, and I haven't met the the Alexandria, yeah, but amazing. incredible people. And so I'm like, for me, I'm going. You know what? You, he preaches in the Astro Dome. Until I'm at that level, I have no I have no critique that I can give that will matter. Yeah, and he communicates to millions of people across the world and, every Sunday. Yeah, and I think here's where it sometimes it's, it's a little challenging. Um, Joel Osteen could be incredibly successful not being a pastor. He's, yes, he's presidential. And he chooses to pastor, even though it probably costs him more than people could ever imagine. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, I'm 
I'm like, hey, uh, nothing but respect. I, I've never seen anything about this man that would make me think he wasn't amazing. Every time I've been around him, I've been inspired. He's only been kind and gracious to me. And so... And I think there's even some people who are really surprised at our opinion. <laughs> I know. You know, because they want me to be against people. I know. Well, they but think we're it, the cool ones, so yeah. we should be against the big ones. I was in Dallas one time, and I went to a clothing store to try and close. <laughs> and lo and behold, T.D. Jakes was in there. <laughs> T.D. Jakes is in there, yeah. And, and he comes up to me, goes, hey... I think you were on the phone with me. He and goes, you're like, hold on. Do, do, you, do you think this jacket looks good on me? <laughs> It was the same jacket. <laughs> and he was kind of messing with you, right? Yeah. No, he actually was asking. Oh, that's so funny. And I realized what a really wonderfully just gracious, humble guy, you know, just going, hey, you know, this, what do yeah, you think yeah. about this jacket? And we just talked and that's so hung funny. out. And, and um, I, I just hope there are more people who are incredibly gifted, incredibly talented, who can create great wealth and who believe in Jesus and believe in, in church and are willing to give their lives to it. Yeah. And, it's really and I can say from my side of it, I'm not anywhere in the space of those guys. Those are in a whole different space. Um, I have so many times just been so tired of the garbage that comes with being a pastor, all the hate from the Christian world. I just, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to write books. I'm just going to be a fashion designer, be a filmmaker. I'm just going to go do something else. So, so that I can no longer be a source of hatred for Christians. And it's actually only my love for Jesus and my love for Mosaic and the church that keeps me in this space. So if you think this is the space to stay in, you know, to, you know, to be able to create all the other things, you're exactly wrong. Yeah. And there are actually people who pastor churches who are more than capable of doing a lot of other things. They're not trying to use the church to take advantage of it. They've actually given their lives. And I'm not surprised that Joel Stein has not taken a salary since 2005. So those of you who are criticizing him, until you have given up your salary for 15 years, maybe you should reserve your judgment. And with that, we're going to say goodnight. So thank you for listening to the Battle Ready podcast. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this episode. I'm sorry for my nasally um, <laughs> voice right now, but I'm just getting over a little bit of a cold. Uh, so rate and review this podcast if you don't mind. Go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review this. Give us five stars. Leave us a comment. Let us know you're listening. Um, also, you can follow us on Battle Ready Podcast on Instagram, and you can listen to this uh, on Spotify and Apple, and you can also watch this on YouTube. You'll notice that we are not in our normal little studio. We are in Mosaic Hollywood in the main room, and we are really grateful that you listened to us. Thank you, Mosaic, for letting us um, use this space. Thank you. All right, talk soon. All right.